Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, this is an interview I did with Joe Corallo. He's been on the live stream before. Uh, fascinating guy, I think has done a ton and just very interesting to listen to. I mean, you, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who's got kind of a more uh, deep knowledge of a lot of comic history. So a lot of great stuff in here. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to him about it. As a heads up, uh, the audio here, I, I was using Zoom for the interview. And it, you, you, it, things dip in and out. I did some cleanup, but you can't fix everything. Um, the, the key to good audio is to record it good in the first place. So I apologize for that. That's on me. Uh, Joe is, is awesome in uh, just, just taking a ton of time. You're going to learn a lot and hear a lot. And uh, I hope you stick around for it. It's a great interview. And without further ado, let's get to it. Hey everybody, I've been wanting uh, to uh, to chat uh, with Joe Claro. Did I get your name right? I should say uh, Corallo. Hmm? Corallo. Ah, I apologize. Yes. Embarrassing for right that. Um, I've been wanting to chat. I, I, you and I have been going back and forth for a while. I've been interested to get you on to kind of talk about uh, your work, the things you've done, a little bit your perspective from the industry. I, I really like it because you're uh, you're coming. Well, two things. We're we'll get into it. Um, you are. Uh, certainly a writer. You're certainly an editor. We'll talk about that, but it's just I'm interested to hear about those pieces and just just you've got a great mind for comics, and I'm I'm excited to talk to you. So thanks for joining me today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, for people who don't know you, uh, can can you kind of tell a bit about like where where you've come from, the kind of things you've produced? You've you've actually done quite a lot, and your your knowledge of comics is super extensive. So can can you kind of tell us a little bit about what you've been up to, what you what you what you do. Well, well, thank you. Yes. Uh, basically, I I started really getting into writing uh, when I was pretty young. I uh, We're going to go way back, just to give people uh, some sort of frame of reference. But basically, I got into comics through the Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics. <laughs> nice. uh, it was uh, issue 28. Um I, I forget exactly what happened, but I remember the cover. Sonic's beating everybody up because he turned bad. And Dr. Robotnik's on the screen in the background. Anyway, uh, I love those games, and it was like this eye-opening experience to be like, there's more story to this? I, I already watched the cartoons and I played video games, but there's, there's more. And um, uh, I, I got it from uh, Kmart. I was with my mom when I was in like, third grade. And then I was just like collecting these Sonic comics. I, I was uh, calling shops, going to shops, trying to fill in uh, back issues. I had subscriptions, all that kind of stuff. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what got me into this. And then, um, there was like some Mario manga I remember reading, two around Super Mario World, just like that, that kind of stuff. And then uh, it really wasn't in high, until high school I started reading stuff like Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, and all that stuff. And I, I was always interested in, in the writing end of things. I took a creative writing class uh, before that, like elementary school, middle school. Uh, my friend Brian, who introduced me to like the Sonic the Hedgehog comics and all that, we would come up with our own like Sonic and Mega Man kind of like fan fiction, and like that's kind of where it all started. Um, I remember I came up with a uh, a character who was uh, like. Dr. Wiley's daughter, who was like a cyborg, which I think for a third grader was very creative. But, uh -huh. but, but yeah, I, uh, but yeah I, I did a lot of creative writing in like, uh, high school, into college, and then I really started taking all that more seriously. And, but it really wasn't until I was about 25 uh, that I was like writing comic scripts and trying to figure stuff out. So this is about 2010. And then twenty oh yeah, twenty eleven was the first time I went to New York Comic Con. I had been to like some smaller cons and that, but that was and I I had been to all of them since then, except obviously it won't be this year. Maybe I'll go to the digital one. But <laughs> but you know, I I, I hadn't missed a, a single con. And um I I tabled um 
you know, in the small press section uh, with some self-published comics and sharing a table with some friends. And, um, you know, it was it was awful. It was a terrible book. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I think you always think you know exactly what you're doing, but you don't. Yeah. And, yeah, so, like, you know, we're trying to to move that sort of stuff. And then, you know, some pros like, you know, Chris Claremont, uh, Tim Sale were kind enough to take a copy and hopefully throw it out before they left the convention center. Yeah. You know? And, uh, yeah, no, it was nice. But, uh, but yeah, then I, and then I started self-publishing some stuff that had a little more weight to it. Uh, I, I, I actually, I met this artist, Danny Lucker on Craigslist <laughs> of all places. Okay. And, uh, and he ended up like, he had gone to college with a friend of mine, but he did, um, since then, uh, Danny's more successful than I am. He did a regression with Helen Bunn and image. He was the artist. on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he went on, he's doing red mother at boom. Okay. Um, he did some stuff at red five, like haunted and, and, and things like that. But, you know, he got his start from, a guy who had no idea what he was doing so there's that but yeah that's um you know it was a lot of self-publishing stuff and figuring things out over time and then getting into like doing some reviews and interviews just just being places and getting to sort of know people by just going to all these cons and then it wasn't until 2014 that i had my first piece published in an, an anthology uh it was uh, geeks out presents power uh through that organization and then uh did a couple of other shorts and then i had the uh, mine anthology to benefit Planned parenthood which came out the end of uh, 2017 and uh, that really you know was sort of like the start of me getting uh, a, a lot more places in in comics uh i got to work on that anthology with you know incredible talent, uh, you know, Neil Gaiman, Simonson, Ando uh, Gail Simone, Gabby Rivera, Jennifer mm-hmm. uh, Benson, uh, Frank Conniff, of Mr. Stuff Series 2000 fan, um, you know, Mara Wilson, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Tommy Lee Edwards, you know, there was a lot of you know, uh, June Brigman, um, so we had a bit of a uh, Roy Richardson, so we had a little bit of a power packer union there yeah um, oh, nice yeah yeah it, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun putting that together Tom Pyre, Stuart Moore, um mark wade like there, there was just a lot of great people you know i had the, the chance to work with on that and then i got more editing work from there you know and had more opportunities to pitch things uh you know it was after that that i had the opportunity to pitch she said destroy to a ball mm-hmm. And uh, that was another great experience. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of where things went. And then, uh, y- you know, uh, mine ended up getting an Eisner nomination for Best Short Story uh, that uh, Ces- uh, Cecil Castellucci and Scott Chandler did. And then we won the Ringo for uh, Best Anthology that year. And now I'm up for another Ringo with the uh, Deadbeats Anthology that uh, came out last year. Uh, we got that nomination. Uh, found out earlier this week so that's exciting too yeah congratulations by the way so some thank uh, you yeah very much congratulations so and i think uh, i may be mistaken about this but is this the first kind of what you did with with deadbeats and we'll get more into that in a moment um Mm -hmm. has have there been ringo nominations for kind of crowdfunded books books that have come through that avenue before i I, i'm sure there must have been but I, i wasn't yeah, it's not as common. Like you really need to be associated with a publisher for that. Um, so, so Deadbeats we got crowdfunded, but it, it's through the way we work, uh, the right. publisher and distributor. So, so that really helps. You know, this is their second Ringo nomination. They got nominated for All We Ever Wanted uh, last year. Gotcha. And I believe I'm trying to think. I want to say Puerto Rico Strong. For, uh, it's that or where we live one last year, but mm-hmm. anyway, um, yeah. And then the, the mine anthology was actually crowdfunded to become a car. 
Ross and put out through Comic Mix. And, uh, you know, okay. we won that Ringo and we got that short story now uh, for the Eisner's. Those are the only nominations that Comic Mix has gotten so far. So, so that was good. Um, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's impressive. Um, I, I think, and by the way, so, you know, I, it's kind of the elephant in the room, a lot of people I know who listen uh, to kind of some of the videos do, the interviews I do, they come from a perspective where I think they either, one or the other, they, they either viewed uh, Deadbeats as kind of a cool anthology, something that's coming up, some people there, or kind of the enemy, that this was a book that was designed to attack. And I'm hoping, by the way, at this point, people are, first of all, that's, that's kind of ludicrous. We'll get into why. But um, sure. I'm hoping that people are are just, you know, listening kind of some of this and that you've been involved in some some projects across a bunch of different publishers. You did work with Vault. You did work with Black Mask. You, you, you kind of have worked with a lot of different creators, names that uh, people love, people dislike, dis- all over the place, just kind of mm-hmm. lots of talents. Um, yeah. But there's, there's a path here about how to come into comics how to write things that are going to get consumed, are going to win awards, are going to get some recognition. And it really doesn't matter what comics you like, don't like, it, the path remains consistent. I think your path into comics is is a strong one. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot to say about just getting your work out there, um, you know, putting out the work, and not doing it in a vacuum. Right. I, I think too often over the years, I've seen people who are trying to be like, you know, I'm, I'm coming up, I'm going to do this comic. And either they are trying to do their 80 issues, space opera out the gate, or they're producing all this stuff and it's not bad, but it's in a vacuum. They are in putting their work out there. They don't have a strong social media presence. They're not going to cons. And people aren't aware and they don't know sort of where to put their work. So it's a lot of like, you, you know, there, there is that networking that has to get done. If for no other reason that you, people need to see your work and that you're doing something. Because, and, and I tell people this a lot, no one is waiting for you to break into the industry. No right. one. You know, no one's like, oh, my God, I'm just waiting. Finally, you're going to give me that comic, and then you're going to be the, you know, the emperor or empress or comics or whatever it is. And it's like, no, that's not, that's not how it works. You got to, yeah. you know, produce stuff, get it out there. I mean, yeah, I, I think it, it's funny you say that because um, there's this perception certainly about uh, networks and kind of how people get into the industry and all the rest. And Mm -hmm. it is all that, you know, regardless of how that plays out, there's a basic level of, you know, you say networking of, of, of shopping your work, of getting your stuff in front of people, because it's not like you're going to be sitting at home and somebody's just magically going to know you're a talent. You, you have to show it somewhere. And I think there's many different routes. Right. And I, I love why I like your story. And from our conversations we've had, you started producing comics. I mean, you started producing the work. And I think that's the mm-hmm. healthiest way over time, both to learn kind of where your flaws are and how to improve and also get that portfolio out. Um, that's healthy network building, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And just, um, you know, get, getting to know people kind of, you know, and you, you create sort of a, a network. And, you know, you look after each other to an extent. Like, it's like, oh, you know, hey, I saw that there's open submissions at this place for an anthology, so I'm going to send you the link, and you'll let me know. You know, like that, that kind of stuff. You know? That's that's healthy. Yeah, you you don't have to be everybody's best friend and deeply involved in their lives. You can have <laughs> these healthy comics acquaintanceships where you kind of keep an eye out for each other and share opportunities. Yeah, I think that's, and that's where um, this network term just gets way too broad. And I think it confuses people, especially people up and coming, where, you know, you you want to have that kind of relationship that you mentioned, where people know who you are, they know the kind of things you can produce and deliver so that when a project comes up that reminds them of you, they'll recommend you or they'll send you a link, like you said, or they'll point you to it. Um, That's, that's normal. That's, that's healthy. I, I think that that's, yeah. And that's that 
and correct them if I'm wrong, but that is still the majority of networks and networking that we're talking about in comics, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I think I think there's some avenues or some people who who don't think that's the case or, or think there's all these other things you have to do, but it's like it's really that's that's really the the backbone of it is mm-hmm. you know getting getting your work cut out there, uh, building up you know the amount of people that kind of know you, and you know it's it's that whole thing where it's like it's not who you know it's who knows you yeah that's well you said. Need pe- you, yeah yeah you need people who will then think about you because then like you know maybe you know there's an anthology coming out or something and you know a buddy of yours from like a few years ago that you've been keeping in touch with you know like reach out and be like oh you know i've been seeing your work and you are getting better you know would you like to be in this you know like that that kind of stuff and, and part of it too is no one comes up at the same time yeah you know and it's that idea of like oh you know you're nice to be you, you, you sort of get your name out there you do the work you know like that person who you know maybe you, you've been friends with or you know you've been trying to break into the industry with for five years maybe now Maybe now they're at, you know, Valiant. Maybe now they're at Marvel. Maybe, you know, like those sort of things happen. And, so, and that's sort of part of it. I, I'm trying to think. I think it might have been Steve Orlando. It, it might have been someone else. I'm trying to think who I talked to at, at a con years ago. That basically said to break into comics, it it's, takes about 10 years for most people. Yeah, you know there there are, there are always exceptions to to that, but you know roughly from when you really start taking it seriously, the amount of work you have to put in, you know either the the cons you have to go to, books you have to you know sell, or the new ideas you have to come up with to keep putting out the sort of input, you know roughly kind of takes about that amount of time to to break in to a point where you feel like you've broken it because you know we we can also make the argument of like the first the first piece you ever get published you're officially broken in you know but a lot of people usually don't feel that way you know it takes about 10 years yeah and but it and and correct me if i'm wrong but it is to start that clock you have to start producing if you think I have an interest in being in comics, I'm just going to go to cons, I'm going to maybe buddy up to some people, and then 10 years later, I'll have that job at Marvel. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of steps you need in between there. No, I, absolutely. There, there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of different ways to do it, too. Like, there's no, there's no one way where it's just like, I... I'm finally writing Amazing Spider-Man, so now I've made it. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's right. like, you know, it, it's this, it's what you want, what your dreams are, what you want to be doing. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many different paths to that. I know we've talked about before, this idea of, like, you know, a lot of people kind of have this very rigid sort of idea, these are the things you do. But so many successful people didn't follow that and you would never say they weren't a success in comics i mean it would you know be crazy to to be like oh well you know art spiegelman never made it into the big two or had a million dollar crowd funder so he's not successful you know like yeah, exactly there, there's so many people who, who have done incredible things who consider themselves successful that don't fit into this tiny Mold. I mean, people like uh, you know Dennis Kitchen and what, what he's done for for decades. The kind mm-hmm. of work that Kitchen Press is, uh, you know, Kitchen Sink Press has put out. Um, you know, I know we talked before too about like first comics. <laughs> that that's that was you know a really big deal that paved the way for things like it. Yeah. You know, and uh, <laughs> you, you know, growl like Mike Growl with you know John Sable one of my favorite comics I, I think it's masterfully paced and it's paced in a way that i think took comics so many years to catch up to just like 
It's true. Uh, it's such like it's just this like perfect blend of like he knew exactly how to use you know the dialogue to slow you down and to just have like rapid action and stuff like that. It's just perfect. But you, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, he he did that for years. He, you know, that was published through a small publisher. You know, it got it was a TV show briefly. No one could say that that was not a success. You know, but it doesn't fit the mold of what what people would call you know success sort of today. You know, it's it's and, it's interesting. And maybe that's where people are just a little bit too obsessive over kind of what the current definition of success looks like, yeah. and they they wind up taking opportunities off their own plate because they're they're so busy being fixated on. You know, I need to have the kind of career that a Kelly Thompson or a Donny Cates has by this mm-hmm. time next year, or I'm failing in comics. Mm-hmm. And and so you miss out on a lot yeah. of avenues. I mean, arguably, and I'm not predicting anything like this, but I mean, those mm-hmm. places, by the time you finally get there, you might discover they're they're not that great. <laughs> But, you know, the, the, working at, at a Marvel or a DC has been kind of the goal for people. But I think working at those companies is probably a, a radically different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So mm-hmm. you know, shooting for that to be your goal, I'm going to be the next Chris Claremont, and John Byrne. It's like, well, you know, Chris Claremont, John Byrne aren't, aren't doing active work anymore. So <laughs> I don't know. Is that the best goal? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, all right, I, I'm a Doctor Who fan, and it, it reminds me of how Colin Baker, when he got to be the Doctor, he was like, I'm going to be longer than Tom Baker, I'm, I'm going to do at least seven years, of the longest running Doctor, and he got two years. Yeah. You know, like like that kind of stuff, like things don't always work out like that, and you know, there's a lot of people that that get shots at the big two and you know sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't it's not necessarily a reflection of their work you know like things happen things are out of people's control yeah you know i, I mean like for for example since you brought up jumper yeah. um you know uh rachel pollock uh who's a good friend of mine i adore her she's a, she's a world-renowned tarot expert uh, the first trained superhero at DC Comics with Coagula back in 1993. 93. Uh, Sorry. 93. I want to underscore it because it, uh, maybe it's a topic for another time, but so many people look at these things and they go, ah, in the last four years, there's been mm-hmm. all of this. But I mean, as you and I have talked about before as well, I, I think, you know, I was reading Doom Patrol and some of these books, <laughs> you know, 30 years yeah. ago. It's it's mm-hmm. not like it's the newest crowd. But anyway, sorry I interrupted you. Go go ahead. No, 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 of course. No, that's, that's important. But she also, uh, she had a short run on um, New Gods. Right. You know, and uh, I believe she was the only trans woman to write uh, at the, uh, like, mainline DC until the last, like, five years, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone else was writing like Vertigo. You know, Helix. Remember Helix? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if you're a trans writer, call then that came from Helix. But uh, or and uh, you know, was, uh, that uh, Howard Shaken one. I was like, I want to say Spinnerella, but it's not Spinnerella. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what you're about. <laughs> anyway, so, and, and she had the. Uh, uh, she had time breakers there with uh, Chris Wesson, but um, you know she was writing New Gods, and John Byrne decided he wanted to write New Gods, and so they fired the team. <laughs> so John Byrne could do New Gods. Yep. So like, and these, that's not a new story. It's uh, you know obviously it's not a new story. It happened decades ago, but. You know, these sort of things happen. Sure. And, you know, I, I mean, there's other similar stories I'm not going to get into, but, you know, it's, you, you can't, on the one hand, it's, it's awful, but on the other hand, you also have, like, I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know if maybe the book 
wasn't selling and John Byrne showing interest in it made them go like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to forget that. Let's get you on. You know, like, uh -huh. I, I don't know. I don't know the situation. I don't you know, but. But if you have your heart set on something like that. And that's all you want to do. It's it would be hard to not get some level of disappointment at some point. Oh, sure. But well, they're not your properties. I think that's the thing yeah. people forget. It, it is a portfolio. And as much as there's the romance of comics and, and everything else and the creative and every, it is a corporate at that level, it's a corporate brand. It's, yeah. you know, their toys, you're, you're playing with their toys. And, and so, you know, things will change and, and they change pretty quickly. I, I mean, has there been any kind of big two property that hasn't gone through some pretty major changes uh, within the last 10 years? I mean, or, or five years, they, they, they shift pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, how many crises have we had in the last five years? Uh, I guess we wrapped up one, started another and we're going to kind of have another sort of. Yeah. It's <laughs> they need a, still... they need a label at this point. It's like, ah, you're tricking us. You don't have crisis in there, but that's what you're doing. Um, yeah. Oh, but you know something too, and this 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 might be classified as a hot take. Okay. But, <laughs> but get ready, get ready, everybody. All right. Uh, House of M was <laughs> just a crisis event, and they just acted like it wasn't. Marvel does crisis events too. You oh, can't absolutely. tell me House of M wasn't just a crisis event. <laughs> absolutely. No, I. It's it's funny people get hung up with the words, the the specific words, and it's like. Uh, well, Marvel's never had a crisis event. It's like, yeah, but, you know, they've, they've completely redone massive parts of their universe all the time. Um, yeah. Out of them, I mean, the Secret Wars just a couple of years ago, I, I would argue mm -hmm. you know, Civil War was not quite in that realm, but close to it. I, I think yeah. whenever you're majorly shuffling around all the players in the books, that is what you're doing. You can call it crisis or not, but that, you know, I remember... Um, uh, kind of Tom Brevoort kind of arguing that uh, it's like, no, we don't do reboots here. It's like, nah, you kind of do though. <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess we, you didn't put reboot on the cover of the, the comic, but I mean, what else are you going to call that? You, you completely upended the status quo of the comic. Yeah, no, it, it, exactly. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to ruffle any feathers at anybody. Sure. House of the crisis event, but it's like, We'll just agree to disagree. That's fine. Like, <laughs> well, and, and that's the other part, too. Actually, it leads into something. Um, we'll see. I, I, I don't want to make you uncomfortable with the topic, but the yeah. idea of just agreeing to disagree, like, you know, it, it is impossible for everyone to get the same take out of a comic. Mm -hmm. um, for years, I, I'm just, uh, this is where I'm, I'm a little confused. So for years, you know, I have a shop. I've got people coming in. I have fierce arguments between you know which company is better, or who's stronger, this character, that cover character, whatever. But those arguments had a different tone than what mm -hmm. we have today, where it feels like the arguments about comics are, have a whole new level of drama uh, or whatever it happens to be. Like the stakes are so incredibly high that it no longer feels like a fun debate about comics anymore. It feels like you know that we're defining what comics are for the rest of all time. And you're on one side or the other period. And, and that that's not natural. Yeah. I, I wonder how much of that is the constant rebooting and resetting and the oh. constant drumbeat of this is the all new, all different. This is the, this is the rebirth. This is, mm -hmm. this is what it's going to be. And then it, you know, getting people riled up thinking like this is it and then oh no but a year or two went by that's not it anymore now it's like, mm -hmm. and, and i wonder if that's escalating how people feel passionately about certain aspects of of these characters and these storylines you, you know and um yeah I, I i feel like that has to play some role in it you know that's a good take i i think it's True, because it does set up a scenario where fans are, you're like, you're on board or you're not on board with this giant reboot we've just done. And yeah. if you're not on board, you're somehow betraying the comic or the characters. And it's, it's, it's this very 
you know, dramatic, you know, we just shuffled everything up. We said it was the most important thing in the world. And by the way, in three years, we're going to pull the rug out from under your feet and it'll be all different and all new. And it's, it creates a kind of manic behavior, I think, in the fans. Yeah. And then it just, it also seems like that combined with just the general way social media works and everything else. It's like putting, mm-hmm. you put, it's putting ants in a jar and just shaking it as hard as you can. And then like, Hey, watch them fight. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot to it. I, I think that's really a, a piece of it. I, I think, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think constantly, if you're constantly changing the status quo, you don't have the status quo. Exactly. Actually, chaos all the time. Yeah. No, exactly. I, I think you, you have no, and it's weird for an industry where, that has prided itself on kind of continuity, this ongoing story, this, you know, with these comics build on each other, people stand on the shoulders of those who have come before, etc. And then contrast that with constant shuffling of the teams and the people and the status quo and everything else that you, you really, like I said, you have no status quo. But yeah. by the way, you are supposed to still care about everything, but not so much that if the comic changes in a way you don't like, that you're you're supposed to just change with it. It's it's it it, it seems like it's asking contradictory things out of fans and so it's not surprising that you get this result yeah and, and i mean there are ways that we all kind of have to cope sure. um there, there are there are just like flat out absurdities mm-hmm. that there's no explanation for that um you just have to live with like um you know and, and i'm not saying this in like a critical way because there's really nothing else i get that there's really no the way to do it unless you actually just completely redo old stories over and over again Mm -hmm. but like the idea that everything in marvel for the most part is still in continuity so the dark phoenix saga happened like eight years ago or something like that it's like i read that and no one talked like that or dressed like that eight years ago so (laughs) i don't you know where it's like you, you have to kind of deal with a lot of those absurdities you you know like how spider-man you know it's like in the first like i feel like people forget (laughs) that peter parker was in high school for like barely over two years and then he was in college forever like yeah (laughs) you know like just that kind of stuff no and then he was still great for a while so (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's it's sad though that he doesn't remember that he was married. You know, that sounds that's like right out of like the Notebook or something. I never watched the Notebook, but I imagine that's what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> Same assumption. Yeah, I think I saw it enough. <laughs> half asleep and maybe drunk, but so uh, someone forgot someone. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it's. Um, it just, it, it, it feels, I'm trying to assess and maybe I, I well, not maybe, I'm sure I, I think about it too much is, I mean, we're, we're all here. We're supposed to be kind of reading, enjoying, and there's so many comics out there. You're not going to be able to get to everything. Um, but there seems like there's so many obstacles placed in our path. And sometimes by the publishers, sometimes by the creators, sometimes by the fans themselves, that it just, it, it muddles the the water. And I, I watch, people check out in that process. It, it just, you, you, you get tired of dealing with it and you just, I, I, you know, it's, it's suddenly becomes not worth it anymore. And that's, that's what I worry about a lot with comics. Yeah. I mean, like you see some of that too. Uh, I mean, like I've dipped in and out, like no, mm-hmm. I've never like really dipped out completely, yeah. but like, you know, like I'll, I'll read, you know, like, you know, there might be like an X-Men reboot or something I'll read and kind of be like, ah, I'm good. I'll just wait for the next one in two years and then come back. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, it doesn't mean I'm not reading other X-Men comics. It doesn't mean I'm not buying a bunch of other Marvel stuff. Like, but, you know, there there's certain things where, you know, like, you know it's, 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 um, I, I just love really good stories. Yeah. So, like, so I, I could be reading comics, but like... Starting in May, um, it got to a point where I was like, you know what, I have all these things in my, my backlog. I'm just going to read a bunch of old comics. That's what I've been doing. I've read like 10 omnibuses, a bunch of other hardcovers, trades, random copies that I've had. 
you know, and it's been a wonderful time. Yeah. You yeah. know, <laughs> comics has right. that background and, and maybe I think it's normal for people to dip in and out of runs. I think maybe the stranger thing is this idea that if you sign up to a comic, you have to be with it forever because a comic meanwhile is shifting characters and creative teams and everything else. And they're, they're making changes. So this idea that, you know, you have to stick with something. And if you, if you like one run over another run, you're somehow betraying the comic. That just seems absurd. Like, like, you may have liked the Paul Smith, the John Romita Jr. X-Men, but then it wanders into something else, the John Byrne, Jim Lee brief era of X-Men. And, and maybe you like that, maybe you didn't. But if you didn't like it, that doesn't mean suddenly, you know, you, you've somehow betrayed the comic. It's just, it's, it's just a weird, I don't know, even just saying that out loud, it sounds absurd. Yeah, I mean, unless your favorite run is the Chuck Austin run, then well, you're just like a bad person. <laughs> so you recently read that right i i recently read it because i i never read it before i skipped it because uh that's well, what everyone said everyone was like don't read this and uh you know i i i was thinking about it and then i found a really cheap lot of the uh trades on ebay it was like 20 bucks for all of them and i was like you know what now's the time this is a, this is a sign and so I, I read all that and uh it's not good. Uh, yeah. it's it's hard to say that it's as bad as I thought it would be because it's it's reached these like mythical yeah. proportions. It's it's gotten to this point where yeah, it's just like the plan nine of outer space X Men. <laughs> And uh, there was no way it was going to live up to that. But it's still absolutely nonsensical. And why does Nurse Annie just have so much, you know, page real estate? Oh, yeah. It was so weird. <laughs> that was the character. Like, it, like it, it, that, that character, Annie just kept coming up and up and up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think you just went through the whole run. Was that the character maybe with the most page space out of the entire run? I, I It feels like. Probably. Like, she had more page space than, like, Iceman. Yeah. Like, it was really weird. And, like, I don't get it. And every time she showed up, there's always, like, a caption or or she would say something about, like, I really don't like mutants all that much. <laughs> it was just like, you know, what's happening? Yeah. It was like, it was the Nurse Annie and like Juggernaut show for like most of that comic. And it's like, what is happening? Except for like that arc where they just randomly go back to like Husk's hometown in Kentucky. Oh, yeah. Just that's Romeo and Juliet for five issues. That uh, yeah, that that particular bit. it's a it's a strange run, and I always think, by the way, that when we get into the really fierce arguments, you get kind of these indie creators and maybe these crowdfunding creators or these different groups. I always think we should bring everybody together and just we can all mutually agree that that run was awful. That could be the unifier of that's, that's the gift it can give us in 2020 is that run is just painful. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. It, 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 especially for someone like myself who was in high school uh going into college around when that was coming out so like you know you got spoiled on like new, new mutants ecstatics and then going right into like we astonishing and it was like wow like this is the best the x books have been in a while mm -hmm. and also this <laughs> it was it, it makes it so much weirder that that happened. <laughs> that's the that's the solicitation text they need to put. It's like, and also this. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perfect. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's funny. I and and by the way, I mean Chuck Austin has had good comics in other places. I think. I mean, I've I've enjoyed some of his Superman. I think he's done stuff yeah. that's serviceable. So it's not even he, you know? he does TV work and he's worked on shows. I, I'm blanking on, on them off the top of my head. But he's worked on shows that I've like looked up on IMDb, and I'm like, "Hey, Chuck Austin worked on that," and they are quality shows. He, yeah. he is a, a talented person. 
the there were so many reasons for that book to not work. You know, it was like, well, you know, all our resources are going to this really cool stuff. So we're just going to dump this on you. And like you can, you know, you could only use certain characters, this and that. And sometimes instances like that create magic. And you hear these stories of these creators. And like, the way that run came to me was I wasn't allowed to use Wolverine in a Wolverine comic. And we had to do this. And it's legendary. You know, like you hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. But a lot of, most of the time, you get Chuck Austin's Uncanny like X-Men run. Yeah. The filler. You know? it, yeah. It, and I think it, it underscores that, you know, any anyone can have a good run or a bad run. Well, I don't know if anybody can have a good run, but anybody can have a bad run. I think that's the mm-hmm. glass. Yes. It. <laughs> it's always possible. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, and, and I don't mean this to disparage Chris Claremont at all, uh-huh. but I've never met I've never met a single person in my life who said Chris Claremont's greatest work was that Nightcrawler miniseries from like eight years ago? Yeah, yeah. No one. Most you know, it, don't know it exists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like it. It happens. It's okay. Not not everything's going to be the greatest thing ever. You know, and um, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. I, I mean, mean uh, geez. And there's different things going on at the time. I think uh, I, I remember enjoying, you know, John Byrne during his kind of moments at uh, where he's doing Alpha Flight and She-Hulk and, and even Namor and all this and Fantastic Four. And, and then he did the West Coast Avengers and his run there, which was fine. Some people remember it fondly, but it, it was the sound of a creative team breaking up. That was it was playing out on the pages like you could just feel the bitterness coming through the pages. And it's there's always stuff going on in the background. It's not always what it yeah. seems. Yeah, and then uh, John Burns also responsible for what is quite possibly the worst run of Doom Patrol. Yes, that's true. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> it's you know, it's not taking anything away from the great work he's done on stuff like X Men, Fantastic Four, and Superman, but like that Doom Patrol run is just universally despised. Yeah, it's like, the one you, you know, I, I mean, it's 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 it just fails on so many levels. It's mind boggling. No, I don't, you I, know, and it's okay. It's it's okay to have um, you know some people that you really revere. They they can go in and have a bad run. There's lots of things can happen. It doesn't mean the end of the world. And and because you don't like it, it doesn't mean that you suddenly hate comics either. It's it just means it's a bad run. It, it can be simple. Yeah, and you may also not know it, but you may love a comic that the creators behind it hated working on. Yeah. You know, you I've, I've heard stories like that where, you know, like a friend of mine like uh, went up to a creator at a con and was like, oh my God, you know, I, I love this comic you did. And they didn't even look up from the table and... They just said something along the lines of, that was a work for hire. Mm-hmm. That was a, you know, like the thing that maybe you read that got you to be like, I'm going to write or draw comics might be something that the person that worked on hated or forgot about immediately. And you just kind of have to be okay with that. Yeah. Your happiness or dislike shouldn't hinge upon other people. It, it gets to yes. be yours and yours alone. Um, which would be a great lesson for all kinds of people right now. But um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I don't think the creative team behind Archie Comics, Sonic the Hedgehog number 28, cared as much about Sonic the Hedgehog as I did. And yeah. that's okay. <laughs> like, you still get to love it. It's fine. Yeah. yeah it's, absolutely. It's, it's, it's weird. This, this seems like, is this a newer phenomenon, by the way, that, or, or it just feels like more and more people have to have acknowledgement for the things they like. It, it's not enough for them to like it. Other people have to like it or vice versa. It's not enough for them to hate it. Everyone has to hate it. Is this, is this, have you seen it, this increase or is it just, is it just me? I think it has, it's increased in the sense that we're more aware of it. Like um, people didn't used to have feelings about it because they never got the chance to find out. 
what so and so thought about such and such. So yeah. you could like create in your head like this idea of, of things. Like for example, like oh, Bill Murray was in Ghostbusters too. He must have loved it. Like yeah. you know, you never had to find this stuff out. Or if you did, you had to like actively look for like physical magazines and things like that. Get mm. interviews, and maybe, maybe they'd say something uh, like that. But now, like people are just tweeting left and right about everything. So it's now we're more informed. So I don't know if it's necessarily people are reacting more strongly. I feel like it's more we just know now. Like we didn't have that information, and now we're getting that information constantly. And and people are, you know, getting upset when they built up in their mind, like, I thought everything was perfect, and this was my show as a kid, and this is like a mistake. And now I have to, like, grapple mentally with this notion that, like, you know, like, the director was abusive. Like, you know, this, you know, actor, actress, you know, was a nightmare on the set, like, those sort of things. But, like, while I don't necessarily get as emotional about that kind of stuff. I understand kind of empathetic to people that like, you know, sort of build things around those, those sort of, you know, shows, or comics, pieces of media, and then learn those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it gets back to the, maybe you don't need to tweet that. And then maybe yes. you don't need to tweet that, you know? <laughs> It's it is this weird balance because um, when you when you say things like I've said things like this I've, I've gotten a response back uh, certainly of you know, well you can't tell me what to tweet and it's like no I'm I'm not saying you you can't tweet it I'm saying maybe you shouldn't that's there's a big difference there everybody's free to post whatever you want but just you know if you're tweeting something out you know maybe that stream of consciousness that you think is really cool that's going out on Twitter is uh, maybe harmful to your own career or maybe. You know, maybe the, what what are you trying to gain out of this tweet? You don't have to put that out there if you want to. I mean, you know, again, nobody's stopping you, but maybe there's some side effects that, you know, you get a post whatever you're thinking, but there's a side effect too. Yeah. And, and I mean, this also kind of, you know, like you could use this like an example. This is purely an example. I am not thinking of any particular creator, <laughs> but like if you're tweeting, you know, like, if you really hated working on a book or, or something, and you're just like, I just want everyone to know I hated working on, you know, this property or whatever it is. Like, you know, some, like, I don't know, like, I have to broke out, like, I hate, I hate my little pony, and I only did those covers for the money or something. Like, if you're tweeting stuff like that, it's like, why? Yeah. Like, you, you know? But, um, you know, it's... It, it's some of the stuff you do that you hate the most is going to be some of the stuff that you just loved for the most or are most well known. Like you don't get to control that sort of stuff. Yeah. And like, it's just something that you just kind of have to, just kind of have to deal with, you know? And, um, you know, speaking of that too, like kind of building on that about, you know, working on comics, getting into comics and all that. One thing, I've noticed that, you know, when people try to break in, there's a pretty substantial percentage that seem to get fixated on, like, this one idea. Like, it, it doesn't seem to be about breaking into comics. It's, like, it's more like, I need to get my space opera done as a comic. And that's what I have to do, and it's all focused on that not getting traction even if they're getting people being like you know it's missing something or this and that they just push through <clears throat> and it never works <laughs> like you, you know i mean are there exceptions to that sure but you, you see that kind of stuff all the time and, and you go to like a little small press section and like a con or, or stuff like that and you see you know some of the people who are trying to do the same just one book and it takes them a while to either make that decision to stop or to diversify their portfolio. Right. And it's like, don't, don't wait. Like if an idea is not catching on fire, 
you know, like give it a reasonable amount of time and then move on to the next idea. Yeah. No, I, I mean, absolutely. You know, I kind of relate to this, but I'm curious, um, and this may be opening up a huge rabbit hole, but, uh, or going down the rabbit hole. Um, so you, you've been an editor and you've been an editor on a number of books. And I feel like there's a massive misunderstanding of what it is that editors do. Hi, I'm back. You there? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Hello. Sorry. Well, okay. um, uh, so this may go down the rabbit hole a little bit, but um, I'm sure. I'm curious um, what, you know, people seem to have a big misunderstanding of what it is that editors do. And mm-hmm. I hear things all the time about, you know, why doesn't the editor go in and take this person's social media account away from them? Or, hey, you know, the editor is picking all the people for this project. Uh, why don't they pick different people? Or why is the editor mm-hmm. hiding this? Can you, from your experience, because you've now edited a number of books with a number of different creators, mm-hmm. um, many well-known creators. Yep. What does an editor do? There are, like, one of the things I think that's important that people need to understand is there are, there are multiple kinds of editors. Yes. You know, you, you have, and depending on the project, you're doing different things. Like, when you're doing, like, an anthology and you're curating and all of that, your role is more of, like, a managing editor. You're kind of keeping everyone on schedule, making sure you're getting all the deliverables in, making sure they fit the specs, you know, that kind of stuff. And you're, and depending on the, the talent that you're working with, you know, it, there are situations where you might need to kind of deep dive into the story a little bit. There's times where you have to like trust the creators you're, you're working with, you know, like, when Neil Gaiman gives you a story, you run it. You don't, you don't go like, "Well, Neil, I think we gotta start from page one." You know, you know, you know it's like it's things to keep in mind. But you know, one thing editors aren't are, you know, um, reading for you know proofreading things like that. Mm-hmm. That's not their job at you know bigger publishers. They tend to hire proofreaders um that that handle that um one thing i have noticed is you know every once in a while you'll see people tweet things like i found this typo and uh how how are they how do they allow this editor to keep working there's a typo in this comic like um yep you know not not to diminish that i understand how like reading a typo can suck you out of a moment i truly get that but at the same time, it wasn't the editor's job. And also, you know, typos go back to the dawn of print. Sure. It's not new. And uh, the, you can read all those, you, know, you can read Silver Age stuff that, that Stan was writing. And uh, the, you'll, so, you'll be shocked sometimes reading some Silver Age comics with the amount of typos you will run into. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know? uh, the uh, the Stan Lee Jack Kirby run on Fantastic Four had, uh, you know, a, a typo an issue and I think for a while it was gag it was a gag that they would refer to of how many typos were in that. It's not like it's not like suddenly quality dropped in the last 10 years. Now, I think it is a safe I think you can make an argument that the quality should be better and always should be better, but yeah. I don't think it, it's not that in the last five years, some things suddenly just drop through the floor. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, and again, I get it. You know, I, I hate typos too. And, you know, when, when I edit, I'm usually editing a smaller project with a smaller publisher. So, you know, a lot of the proofreading and stuff like that also falls on me. So I get that. But, you know, when you're dealing with these bigger companies, it's usually not, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's either a proofreader, something an intern will be doing. It's not like the amount of work that goes into editing. You know, there just isn't that time to do that like last pass. You know, you're dealing with people, you know, are also kind of working as like a mini managing editor in some respects where you're dealing with, you know, checking on the talent, making sure they're getting stuff in. You know, I, I know when I'm editing stuff, you know, it's like, it depends on the project and the creator. Right. 
And there are some projects, like some anthology things, that, you know, you're not really having to do that much. But then there's also stuff where, you know, I'm working on things and I, I work very collaboratively. Like, uh, Mags and I are, are very collaborative. And uh, she's, she's very easy to work with um, in, in those terms. And we can, you know, break down a story and sort of talk about it and approach things in a, in a way where, you want the person you're editing to tell their best story. You are not trying to tell your story. That's, and a, I, great point. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, I, I think, is it safe to say that the, you know, and again, I, I recognize again, I think this is an important thing to underscore. There are many different types of editors. There's many different roles. Mm -hmm. There's many different pieces there. But one of the core jobs is to try and unlock the best possible story for both the creative talent you've assembled and the brain. Mm -hmm. It's got to both has to go. That's that's kind of you've got to unlock it. You've got to unlock yeah. the story, their opportunity. Yeah. You know, and I mean, like when, when you're dealing with something like, you know, big two publisher and it goes back and forth. It's not always like this, but you have editorial environments where, you know, it might be more editorially driven where the editors kind of have these ideas and they want to you know follow through with that and execute those and be like you know like this is what we want the fantastic four to be and let's get in who we need to get in to tell this story we've come up with you know and, and then you also get other editorial groups or you know editorial environments where it's the other way around where it's like Let's call Frank Miller and see what he wants to do with Batman. You right. know, like that kind of stuff. So, so those things do shift in different groups and different companies at different times. Part of that is also something that I noticed doesn't get talked about that much either. And like, like when you look at like, especially I feel like Marvel. I know it was the case in DC too, but like when you look at Marvel through the seventies and eighties. Every editor was like also a writer. Yeah. yeah. Every one of them. It's like, you know, you, all these editors, you know, <laughs> you know Roy Thomas, Jerry Conway, Carl Potts, you know, um, trying to think, you know, there's just so many, Louis Simonson, you, you know, everyone's kind of doing, jumping around. And you, it's easier to get into a situation like when you look at those Axe books. You know, when, when Claremont was doing that and, you know, Weezy's doing X Factor and, you know, Ando Stenti's doing some stuff on the side that relates to X-Men. They're all kind of like editing each other, you know, like it's, that's also a different environment, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, yeah, so like those, those are all sort of things to like keep in mind. But like, like um, while we're on this topic too, what I think is really interesting is the way you see not just comic social media, but like comics news sites. Yeah. You know, with how crazy things get, you know, like, oh, it's all over. What is this? Like, one editor has left. What will this be? You know, those kind of talks. You're like, this editor moves to this company. How will this destroy the industry? You know, those kind yeah. of headlines. And it's like, I don't know what they would have done in the 70s and 80s. When it was just like, well, Marvel's gone through like five hundred chiefs. So like, yeah, you, you know, it's it's crazy, and it also is interesting when you look at that, and you look at books like Claremont's X Men early on. There is no reason that should have worked with the amount of times the editors changed hands as as that book was going. It's like that. that was Working in, in spite of everything that was going on around it, and that's a lot of comics, and you know, Marvel of the, you know, seventies into the eighties. It's like, how many times are editors going to change? It's all like working and, and doing some some great work that that came out of that chaos. But if anything remotely close to that level of chaos is happening now, it would be the end of comics. Well, I mean. It, it is, uh, it, you know, obviously, and I, I've tried to say it, it's the DC layoffs and everything just recently happened. It's it's uh, it's had people lose their jobs. Um, I think that that's a that's 
you know, it's, it's obviously a, a traumatic event for some people and it's a shakeup. Yeah. But in, in 96, um, Marvel laid off like almost 300 people. Yeah. And that, I mean, that, that happened. We're, we're no longer, we're nowhere close to that today. It's like you said, these, these changes have been happening pretty consistently. I, I think the one consistent thing about comics is that a lot of these things have happened before and happened a lot before. And so yeah. it, it's, I, I, obviously, I mean, I have a, a general dislike of, of news sites and clickbait and other things. So I think they, they intentionally, hopefully intentionally, maybe they're just ignorant. I don't know, mislead mm-hmm. people about what's going on. And so when you write things like, you know, these, these, these four editors, again, it's sad that they lost their job, but these four editors are gone. Will DC even be able to print comics anymore? And it's like, I mean, are you insane that, that <laughs> I don't, it, it just, I don't know what value that serves other than it's getting that site a click and some ads. Absolutely. And like, you know, you, you wish people well in these situations. Like I, I've been, I, I've, been laid off before it happens like um, it's not great no one wants to deal with that and you hope everyone lands on their feet you know some people might use this as a way to get out of comics and do something else some of the people involved um, might get picked up by different companies um i saw dirk wood Mm -hmm. and um alex Cut or I'm blanking on his last name, but they were both at uh, IDW and now they're both at Image. Yeah, you, you know they were picked up very quickly. So I mean, you know, it's it's shifting around, but you know, people that want to be in, in comics, you know, like you to find a path, you know, maybe start a new, you know, small publishing arm, join another publisher, come up with some sort of new and inventive ideas you, you know there there are possibilities and you know i hope it works out for for people and at the same time maybe when when things settle down dc will be able to bring in new people that will have new ideas and new things that will, you know end up you know rejuvenating the line in a way like i i I hope you feel this way. I hope a lot of people feel this way. I I really hope I haven't read the best comic I'm going to read in my life yet. Oh yeah, absolutely. You I, know, it's 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 good that you said that because I think um, we can't always be looking backward. Uh, we have to have hope that there's better things to come. And I think if if you enter into comics believing that you've read the best work you're going to read and everything is downhill from here. I think that's, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep reading comics if I, if I believe that I'd, I'd call it a day. I'm like, well, it's, it's as good as it's going to get. And I'm going to move on to some other hobby that has a potential for some, some up. Um, I, yeah. I, I believe that there will be a better comic in my future. I, and I don't think that's a crazy belief. It's, it's been proven right for four decades now. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's some absolutely fantastic work happening now. And there's also some absolutely fantastic stuff that's happened in the past that people skipped over. You know, um, I, I'm a huge fan of like the Silver Age Legion superheroes and stuff like that. I know there are plenty of people that haven't read it. And mm-hmm. I think it's some of the best stuff in the Silver Age. I, I think the Doom Patrol from Arnold Drake is, is uh, some of the best Silver Age comics. Um, you know, I, I love the history of comics. It's just like I, I've got that. You know, when I heard early on as I was trying to get into comics that like the contract with God and uh, it rhymes with lust were like two of the first graphic novels, I found them and I read them. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like that that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and don't be afraid to try stuff outside of your wheelhouse because you'll learn things and be a more aware person like um reading you know manga, reading european comics reading web comics um you know like as far as we've come in, in a lot of ways there's still some weird hangups that people have like i do notice there are People. It's not everyone, but you still get people where 
it's like, oh, they they don't want to read Fun Home because they're not queer. Mm -hmm. You know, you still get weird stuff like that. It's like, this is an incredible piece of work that was adapted for the stage. You know, like you can you can read that without being of that background and experience. And um, that also and also to push the point further, Alison Bechdel is an incredibly successful cartoonist, despite never having a run on like Batman or crowdfunding something for a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there, there's there's good com- it, it's, it's Comics have so many different styles and stories and, and pieces to it. I do, I do get irritated with the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, the typecasting. You're making me think here, so um, we'll see if this all comes out right. But I, I think sure. it is, you know, I, I think people are very quick to label a comic and and very quick to say, well, this comic because of this creator or maybe something they've said on social media or maybe the you know often terrible marketing that was done for the book. It's it's only going to appeal to this very narrow slice. Uh, that's not me, so therefore. You know, it's garbage. I'm going to ignore it. It's it's it. It feels like we we get backed into those typecasting kind of elements for comics, and we miss out on a lot of great stories. Uh, when I first read Watchmen, um, it, it, you couldn't have come to me and said, "Hey, how would you like a kind of political analogy story, dark and gritty look?" I, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't have been sold by that if it would have been described that way. But yeah. I really like that comic. And and I'm willing to bet a lot of people, same thing with the the X-Men in general. Hey, it's a it's a superhero book, but it's a superhero book that's going to touch on a lot of kind of modern day themes and and have elements of danger, uh, touch on kind of racism and some of these other topics, but also very much be an adventure book. I mean, that pitch, I guess you could make any comic book sound terrible in a pitch. Yeah. And so be wary of kind of your first impression of something and and i just i think people miss out on a lot of good titles that way yeah i I think there's that i think a lot of people miss out on a lot of great like graphic novels like uh, two of my favorite graphic novels it's the same french creative team i i will butcher their names so i I, (laughs) well i do that every time (laughs) yeah but uh it's uh beautiful darkness and uh satania and it's the same team. They are gorgeous, dark graphic novels uh, that are just some of my j- just favorite things. I I love flipping through those. They uh, they're wonderful works. Um, a, a lot of just slice of life might not be like the best word for it, but these like very personal stories, like the this French uh, graphic novel, epileptic. Mm-hmm. about this family who who's dealing with having an epileptic son and all of the trials and tribulations they go to to try to help their son like it's it's such a great book yeah you, you know there there are That's so many things like that that don't get talked about because we're waiting for Jim Shooter to save us yeah, <laughs> yeah no I, I yeah exactly <laughs> I, I think it is interesting. Um, we get fixated on a couple names, a couple people, and, and make no mistake about it. I did the recent thing. Um, you know, Shooter brought a lot to Marvel in the '80s, and I think you know, I I, I think he, he deserves plenty of credit for what he did. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that you can you know plunk Shooter into current Marvel and then wave a magic wand and you know just give him uh, Joe Casada's job and then suddenly everything is better. Like like whatever you know, the sales triple. And everything else. I mean, Shooter knew how not to go off on that tangent, but Shooter knew how to work the newsstand and that channel. A lot of the things he did does not exist today. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't have good ideas that people should learn from. I think comics in general would benefit from listening to a lot of people in the past. But it also the scenario is not the same as it was. It's like it's not going to be the same result because the the world and the landscape has shifted a lot. No, absolutely. I mean, some of, when you look at what some people are doing, like uh, Spike Trotman with Iron Circus has done a lot, has done, at this point, several six-figure uh, comics campaigns on Kickstarter. Uh, you, you know, has sold enough to create a business, have an assistant, like all these sort of things. There are paths to doing different things in in comics that are successful 
And I, I feel like there's also like concern trolling in regards to success that happens on Twitter and things like that, where it's just like, oh, sure, you got all these books, but are you really that successful? Like, yeah. you know, it's like, why, why do you care? Like, <laughs> you, you know, it's like, just, just do comics, dude, do what you want to do. And, uh, you know, and if you can make it that way, it's fantastic. Like, what, what more is there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up because it does feel like, there's just there's so much concern about what we are supposed to like or what we're not supposed to like and and you know oh this person likes this book so therefore you know this that and the other thing i think um it, it just again it all feels like a barrier to people just enjoying comics and yeah. i i don't know why we we need to be concerned with that it just so so i mean you know i'm i'm talking with you i i, I like i said we've had many conversations before i think yeah. uh you're a smart guy, you know your your history, and I, I like your insights on things. And I think you've you've edited lots of things. Um, there's a bunch of people, I think, probably well, not a bunch. There's a handful of people listening to this right now who might be saying, "Oh, he he worked on you know Kim and Kim, so therefore he's in the he's in the other camp of comedy. He's in the he's with those other people." But does anybody like they really you cut out there for oh. a sec? Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, shoot. Yeah, you cut out with uh, you're a smart guy. We could just in there. No, you're a smart guy. I, I like talking with you. I like your insights, and I think you you do a good work. I, I know that there's some people listening to this who will go, "Oh, uh, he he edited uh, Kim and Kim." Um, mm-hmm. That 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 uh, writer has been a topic of videos, and that's a that's an enemy book. Like how 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 do we get off of that topic? I, I don't even know if I'm asking a, a serious question. This is a question would be much better with beer. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I think it's just like, it's such a loss for people. It's just like, if, especially when it comes to a book like Kim and Kim, it's like, you don't have a, a history. You're, nothing's getting ruined by a book existing that might not be for you, you know? <laughs> and, I, I just think that's so bizarre when people get hung up on on things like that. Either you like the book or you don't. You know, um, I thoroughly enjoyed editing the volume three of Kim and Kim. I think it was a very uh, important piece. We uh, really worked to delve in and flesh out the uh, relationship that Kim Q had with her father, which is uh-huh. complicated. Uh, relationship that I think uh, Mags really delivers on. Um, you, you know, I, I think also Planet Earth and we did a comes on Mag stepping into more of a uh, kind of Star Trek slice of life kind of take was uh, some good work. I, I'm really glad, you know, I got to work on it and mm-hmm. we get messages, like I as the editor have gotten messages from people about how they've enjoyed that book. So I can only imagine the the positive receptions that people like, you know, Mags or Columbia uh, or you know, the artists. Like it, yeah. But, you know, something else that I think is important to keep in mind, that when you get people who are, like, concerned trolling success, yeah. And, you know, they'll go in and be like, oh, ho, ho, like, you, know, like, you, know, you know, the trade only sold X an hour or whatever it is. And, you know, Mags didn't sell enough trades to retire forever. So that's a failure. Like those kind of weird arguments. It's also keeping in mind that's not a whole picture. Right. When you go to, like, there are some books that are also like, they're pan sellers. You go to a con with a few boxes and you're out before the end of the show. Mm-hmm. And like Kim and Kim is a big hand seller for, for the people who worked on that book. You know, like people love getting them at cons. So like that's also not reflective of the amount of people who could have purchased the book. You know, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot of weird misinformation there's a lot of 
ignoring reality to fit a certain narrative. Sure. Um, one thing that I, I've seen come up is um, this idea of like, uh, you know, I, I've seen some people who like, oh, we got to beat deadbeats or whatever. And not seem to understand what anthropology is. Yeah. Where, you know, it'll sort of be like, you know, how much money could people have possibly been paying? Like, well, it's not much because they only did like six pages. So. Well, yeah. And, and I guess I'll, I'll just ask the question directly. So, can yeah. you describe the meeting? where you and the other kind of Deadbeats creators sat in a shadowy room with giant glasses of kind of some dark uh, wine and you plotted the destruction of Western comics. Can you describe how that meeting went? Yeah, I mean, um, basically, <laughs> we all... Um, I'm to think. We all were watching Broad City. Oh, good, yeah. You know, we had... Uh, we were blasting some, like, Tegan and Sarah. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, and um, we all had a cult pendant hmm. because um, we also hate Christ. I just want to make that clear. Oh, that's good for yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. Yeah, you know, or else it, the magic is No, um, it, you know. <laughs> I know there's some people be super irritated that I, I ask that in a sarcastic way, but it's just, um, I, I mean... there I did see a lot of the comments like, hey, this comic existed to somehow hurt and I don't remember who was crowdfunding at the time. If it was, uh, I don't remember who was who was. But there was this this narrative out there, like, oh, they they're only doing this to hurt this other book that launched about the same time. And that's just that's that that's not how comics works. And your audiences were entirely different. Like, yeah, I <laughs> I don't think there was a ton of overlap. Um, but no, I I mean the you know we didn't really get involved in any of that we weren't really thinking of that yeah. um, it was a cute idea i had because i really like music i like horror and i was like i'd love to do a horror anthology with like a you know crypt keeper kind of character but like hey what if she like ran a record store and like right. we could do some something cute like that and uh, talked to a couple of people got it going through the way of the world because you know, uh, the publisher there, Tyler, was a fan of the mine anthology. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was very supportive. So when I was like, oh, you know, I, I have this track record of doing this thing with these creators. And, you know, we were able to, you know, successfully pitch that, get that going. You know, you go through people that, you know, you're like, oh, I've worked with you, or I'd like to work with you. Yeah. And like, there's nothing beyond that. It wasn't like, hey, you want to destroy everything? I guess no. It was just like, oh, you want to do this thing? It's just a cute little thing. And for a lot of people, you know, no one was able to retire on the money that they got. Sure, of course. But, um, you know, for a lot of creators, it was like, oh, you know, like, this will be a nice thing for me to do in my downtime. Oh, it's six pages or eight or four. Like, oh, you know, I, I got like four or five months to do it. No, that, that sounds great. You know, like that kind of thing. And then one of the things I, I was really excited about doing this, I, mean, I, I was excited for, for everyone involved, like, that we were basically able to get every single person we wanted to book. But um, I was very happy that we got uh, Rachel Pollock uh -huh. and uh, Richard Case to have a, a reunion. It was the first time yeah, they worked together since uh, Doom Patrol. Yeah. When uh, he was there to do the transition from, you know, Grant Morrison to Rachel, he stayed on a little extra, kind of smooth that process out. And, uh, you know, we also got John Workman. And I love John Workman. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know who John Workman is, maybe you don't like comics enough. <laughs> Take that. John Workman's one of the... John Workman's one of the... Greatest letters of all time, but um, yeah, you, you know, because John Workman lettered that run, and I sent him a nice email and he emailed back, and he was all excited to do it, and like that kind of stuff really makes makes me all happy inside. 
I just, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, I think it, it's a complicated thing because I think people bring in a lot of different grievances or issues all at once. And I think that, uh, you know, I, again, I don't mean to put you on a spot here, but I think if you look yeah. at mm-hmm. kind of all the things people complain about, you know, hey, there's, mm-hmm. I, I have to believe, and maybe I'm naive and mistaken about this, but about 75% of those things, I suspect most people agree on whatever your, your, your politics are, your social, whatever it is like, Comics are expensive to the point where it's tough for new people who are not interested in comics to come in to get them. I think there's a valid argument to be made there. It, it doesn't mean mm-hmm. you can play a magic wand and suddenly they're cheaper, but you know, there's that's a valid argument. I think comics rebooting all the time, kind of random choices on on when they the storylines start and end, and what decides to get published. Is there enough quality control? I mean, I think these are all valid topics, but it feels like uh, we we really hone in on the the kind of the 15% of difference. And that is what runs all the conversations. And it just, it, it's, it, to your earlier point, I think it's exhausting. I think it keeps people from reading comics that they might enjoy. Absolutely. I mean, I think part of this here too is getting someone into comics is different for everyone. I, yeah. I do think the best way usually to get someone in the comics at first is like a, a trade collection of a complete story. So they have some closure and they're like, oh, this was the good story. Yep. Uh, you know, and it's different for everyone. Like, uh, you know, in college, I made multiple people CD mixes of uh, David Bowie. I'm a big David Bowie fan. Um, and when you make a mix for someone, you don't just make the same mix. You craft it to each individual person, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe you're a little more, you know, Ziggy Stardust heavy on one, a little more thin like Duke heavy on the other, you know, you, you do what you got to do. So for something like this, you know, it's like, you can't, you can't just be like, Watchmen, read this. You're into comics now. Like it's, it's a delicate thing. It is. No, and, and everybody's going to have a, a kind of unique place to go in. I guess, and again, I know some people disagree with this, but that crossover audio, when we were talking, and I, I, I do apologize, I do not remember the crowdfunded book that was coming out of it was one of uh, Richard Myers or, or Ethan's, or I, it was one of the bigger ones, I know. I think, I think what happened is the day it launched, it, it launched after us, I think, was uh, The Littlest Umbrella. I think launched after us, and there was this whole weird thing. No one knew about it. Like, I was only just keeping tabs just to, you know, like, I would see things because I would term search when the book went live because you want to, like, like and retweet when people are plugging your book. Of course. So, you know, in doing that, you would catch all this other stuff. And, like, you know, you get these, like, weird sort of, like, uh, I'm pushing this campaign up, and we're going to do this, and we're going to show those that. And it was like, I don't know you. Yeah, <laughs> it just feels a little, um, and again, I know that there's a lot of backgrounds. And, and by the way, I mean, for what it's worth, and uh, you know, I'm not going to, again, put you on the spot with this at all, but I, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of things that get tweeted by people, uh, creators included, that are, I think, bad ideas. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, I think that's true, and I think that there's, things that are antagonistic and needlessly poke fans. I think all that is true. And I wish they would. I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't wish they wouldn't to the point that I want to take social media away from people, but I do think it's detrimental to their careers. It doesn't help fans. All that is true. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to these two books, like I, I, I have trouble in my head picturing somebody, if it was a, the, the lowest umbrella, I have trouble picturing somebody, they're holding their money in their hand. They're like, hmm. Do I want to get the Littlest Umbrella? Do I want to get Deadbeats? I can't. I, I boy, I want both books. Uh, where am I going to put my money? And you're fighting over the same consumer. I don't think that. I don't think anyone was in that position. There's, there's yeah, no. <laughs> totally different audiences. There, there wasn't, and like um, I didn't even really bring it up to people involved in the campaign because, like, I didn't want to bother anybody or make a big deal out of it or anything, and. Um, you know, like after the fact, I think I, I mentioned something to one of the creators. You know, again, it's just like, who's that? Like, what? <laughs> you know, like, it was very, it was very bizarre. I, I mean, on the, on the 
positive side and think, you know, like I, I wasn't personally brings too much. Um, there were weird, you know, things you get like tagged in or like, you know, this drama would put up like an article about, you know, like this book launched and, uh, you know, so you'd get tagged into like weird stuff and I've like muted a bunch of people, but like it wasn't like, I, I know people who've gone through worse, but it was just bizarre. It was like, it's, it's just a, a music themed horror anthology. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, and, and a couple of the creators certainly have been more vocal on social media and, and I don't approve of, of kind of all that, but it is, again, it is their social media and you, you're welcome to mute. I, I do that with plenty of people who just kind of are annoying in one note, but it, it doesn't have to become bigger than that. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not something we can solve, uh, certainly the two of us, but I think, and I didn't mean to send us too far down that track, but it's, it's, there's a lot of comics out there. There's plenty for everyone. I think the more narrow minded you are about the comics that you're at least giving a check out to, you know, the less you're going to read, the, the less, you know, you're, you're leaving value on the table for yourself. I mean, you're really, you're not hurting the publishers in a lot of cases. You're hurting you by not seeing some of these other books. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love so many different kinds of comics um, from all different periods. Y you know, like uh, y you know, no one, none, no one's talking about Harry and the Pirates or uh, yeah. you know, w the work of Windsor McKay. All that stuff's great, but like, uh, or even like Garfield. I loved Garfield as a kid. I would <laughs> read the Sunday paper for Garfield. I would watch that Garfield and Friends cartoon in the eighties. Oh no. Like, <laughs> you know, um, it's, no, it's not kidding. great. Um, you know, I, I still catch myself, you know, around the holidays. Uh, I'll watch the uh, corresponding Garfield or uh, Charlie Brown special. I'm I'm not above that. You know, and it's all it's all comics and it's great. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's you you, you can't solve everything. You know, just, you know, people talking, but at the same time, it's like, there, there's a lot of antagonism directed at people. And it's just like, you don't have to engage yeah. people. If you don't like a comic that's coming out, why are you tagging the creators involved? Or why are you slipping into their mentions or DMing them? Why are you making, you know, a video about how you like, personally hate this person you know <laughs> like, I there's a difference between like reviews and even standing reviews and just being a dick yeah. and like you know it's it's like why bother doing that yeah. and you know you take that even just further because I mean like I don't think people you know again like, I don't think I'd appreciate if someone did that to me so I'm not going to it's like why why do you hate it so so much that you have to you can't help yourself you have to reach out and tell this person and even from a more pragmatic point reaching out to that person isn't going to help because if you're dealing with someone for example who's at the big two and you, you're just like i can't help it my heart is burning and i need to tell them how much i hate how they're handling batman or something like that uh -huh. X amount of issues are already in the bag. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, they're like three, four, sometimes four issues, like, done. Your grievance will not be solved then, even if you have the best inarguable point. Yeah. And we're like, this is awful, and this needs to change right away. Even if you change their mind, and you made them see the light, it's still like, look at all those Next two issues are already printed, so yeah. Sorry, like <laughs> it feels like the best thing you could do for yourself, just for your own well-being, is just don't spend your money on things that are going to drive you insane, and start there. And no, that's not. I, I understand the flippant comment of like, if you don't like it, don't buy it. Because oftentimes when people use it, I think it's a true statement. It's also kind of a big statement. I, I think it's it's one of those things that is true in its in its fact, but also it's often said as a you know barb in an argument. But yeah. 
forget about everybody else for your own well-being. Just don't buy things that make you crazy. Like, mm -hmm. don't spend your money. Don't double down on you being crazy and losing your money. That's 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 nuts. But I, yeah. I wanted to do this. I, I so we've had a great conversation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping we can talk more in the future if you'd be open to it. Yeah, and um, you know, sort of build on your point of that idea of you know, you know like buy it. How that can be flipped, how that can be this event. I, as well as you, and literally everyone that has read a comic has read comics they don't like. Yes. It happens. And it is okay to read a comic, not like it, and end it there. You there doesn't have to be further drama. There doesn't have to be people being, you know, dragged out or, or called out for ruining a, a, a character or ruining this and that or destroying everything they ever loved about this franchise. You can just drop that, move on to another comic. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's No, it is. And I think it's, you know, I, it, it, this will open up a whole other topic. So we'll have to do this another time. But I think sure. it's okay to to move on. I mean, first for your own safety, it's like a, like a patient on the operating table. Stop the bleeding, i.e., stop spending the money. If if you hate something, stop stop letting the cash flow out of your wallet. Just just move on. Spend your money somewhere mm -hmm. else. Lots of comics. And then, kind of step two, it's um, and it's a harder point to make. But if if something bothers you, there's ways to express it. You don't have to just keep your mouth shut. You can go on to social. Mm -hmm. I didn't like this issue. I thought it was goofy. I thought the Iron Man 2020 was painfully bad, but. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can do that in such a way where you're clearly expressing your dislike, you're you're making fun of it, whatever you're doing to kind of vent, whatever you have to do, without mm -hmm. it turning into a let's find a creator and nail them to a wall and burn that wall down. Like it, it <laughs> yeah. And you could you could also do it not on social media. You can uh, you can DM a friend of yours, be like, did you read this issue? I thought it was this way. Oh, I did too. Oh, great. There you go. You got it out of your system. Yeah. Vent, you don't have to, it, and it's it's to the point earlier with Chuck Austin, everyone, I think every creator has had a clunky, bad comic. Include, I mean, mm -hmm. Lee has had a bad comic. Jim Shooter has had some bad comics. I mean, go, oh, who knows? Yes. They all, <laughs> yes. everybody has made a mistake. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, so, some of my favorite creators of all time I've done comics I don't like, and that's okay. And maybe those comics are someone else's favorite, and they can be my favorite, and that's okay too. That's true. It's it's everybody else loving it, and you didn't. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means you know what you like. So yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. I, I appreciate all the time you've given me, and and let's let's talk again. I think we have got we we just scratched the surface of all the things we can talk about, and. I love that you came on and, and we can have a chat and I think it's hopefully giving some people something to think about it, you know, so, so I just got to say, thank you. Thank you for taking all this time. No problem. Thank you for having me. I love talking comics, comics history, just all, all sorts of different things. We didn't even get to talk about like uh, web comics, like oh. in the theater, which really got me into web comics and all these other things. So, that yeah. so let's get back out. We have to do that again. I, I think, um, Yes, we got so much more to talk about, but but thank you for your time today, and and we'll catch up again real soon. Sounds great, thank you.